Welcome to the Peace Talk, this time with Gordon Hahn. Gordon Hahn is a political scientist who received his PhD at the Boston University. Hahn was a George Cannon Institute for Advanced Russian Studies Fellow. He was an Open Society Institute Academic Fellow. The, Un the US National Counterterrorism Center funded from 2009 till 2012 a research project of Hahn, and he received an US Embassy Policy Specialist grant in 2012. Hahn taught at many universities, uh, the Boston, American, Stanford, San Jose, St. Petersburg, and San Francisco University. He published several books and various articles. Gordon Hahn, I'm very glad and honored that you found the time for this interview. Thank you for inviting me. Um, let me start, if I may, with a short biography, um, with a personal question. What was your motivation to study political science? And did you have any academic role models? Um, well, my original uh, uh, I guess inspiration was um, I was more most interested in Russian history and culture, uh, but I quickly realized that it would be harder to make a <laughs> make a career in uh, Russian history and culture. So I decided to study uh, Russian politics. Um, my earliest uh, uh, intellectual ins uh, inspiration came from um, really some key books. Uh, the Icon and the Axe by James Billington, which again was a history of Russian culture. Uh, and that sort of uh, started the process. And, and then um, some of the more classic works on, because when I first started um, studying Russia, it was actually still the Soviet Union, the last years under Gorbachev. And so I was studying uh, the, the Sovietological classics, things like um, Merle Feinsad's um, uh, Smolensk under Soviet rule and uh, how uh, how Russia is ruled, those classics by Merle Feinsad, History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union by uh, Leonard Shapiro. Um, those are sort of the books that uh, I remember most uh, is uh, inspiring me when I first started studying. Okay, so you're an expert on Russian history, Russian culture, and also Russian politics. Uh, I'm doing my best with history and culture. Um, I've, I've returned to that recently. I just wrote a new book manuscript, which I'm still trying to publish on that subject. Uh, I have a new book coming out on history of uh, Russian Western relations. And my previous book was on the Ukrainian crisis. Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned now, um, let's move on to the first question. Um, in 2018, you wrote the book Ukraine Over the Edge, Russia, mm -hmm. the West and the New Cold War. So uh, let us start with a, a historical context. How does the conflict start in 2014? Well, the conflict has a long history going back even before, uh, really since the collapse of the Soviet Union, when um, uh, the new um, independent Ukraine uh, is really in many ways a very divided state. There is no single Ukrainian national identity, or if there is a Ukrainian national identity, it's mostly adhered to in the western part of the country. In the southeast and the east, um, many Ukrainians there are, are Russian-speaking. They identify with uh, Russian and Soviet culture. Uh, the two parts of the country were at odds during uh, the Great Patriotic War, War during World War II, when in the East, uh, uh, obviously, there was more support for the Soviet army. Uh, and, in the, and in the West, there was um, considerable support, in fact, in an, an entire uh, a partisan army that supported uh, the fascists. So it's a country that really has many internal problems. And Immediately after the Cold War, unfortunately, the West and Russia um, tried to uh, strengthen their influence inside the country. And with the expansion of NATO, which was um, it's always been my view, has been a mistaken policy without somehow in, including Russia, uh, led to the in inevitable situation in which all the countries to the West of Ukraine were now members of NATO <laughs> and Ukraine was not a member of NATO. And the logic of the expansion, which was described once by Brzezinski, I'm summarizing here, but essentially, and this was not something he, he was necessarily arguing as a, a point in support for NATO expansion, though he did support NATO expansion, was the fact that, you know, every time there was a, an expansion, 
Then there was a new state that was left outside of NATO in a supposedly vulnerable situation, although we were saying, at least in the early 90s and even the late 90s, that NATO expansion had nothing to do with Russia, uh, that countries would be, the countries that bordered the, the countries just recently brought into NATO were now vulnerable outside. And to protect the uh, security of the countries that were inside NATO, we needed to expand NATO further to the east. And so you have this uh, internal logic of ever expanding NATO until it gets to Russia's borders. And with NATO expansion, you know, looking at, if you look at the, with NATO expansion, it usually comes EU expansion. If you look at the history of countries that have joined NATO, you'll notice that on average, eight years before they became members of NATO, they signed a, um, a cooperation agreement with the European Union. Um, and that was what was on the, uh, on the schedule for 2013, in uh, no, uh, October 2013, uh, when Yanukovych, President Yanukovych, was to sign such an agreement with the EU, Putin actually stepped in and, and offered uh, Ukraine, um, I think it was a $15 billion in loan relief uh, to uh, help Yanukovych because the government was basically uh, <laughs> on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, in 2008, the United States had made a blanket statement that someday Georgia and Ukraine will be NATO members. So the handwriting was on the wall as far as the Kremlin was concerned. Was concerned. Ukraine would become an EU member, then become a, a NATO member, and then Russia would have a problem for its uh, Black Sea fleet. What, what are they going to do with the Black Sea? You can't have a Russian Black Sea fleet stationed in a NATO, NATO member country. So this basically became a fight over the Black Sea region, not just Ukraine, but also the, the Black Sea region, which historically has been uh, Russia's uh, gateway to the Mediterranean. So this had um, important uh, naval national security implications, along with the uh, national security issues uh, across the, along the border with um, Russia and Ukraine. So that sort of set the stage for the crisis uh, that led to the then violent overthrow by the radical wing of the Maidan protest movement, the, the neo nationalists the neo-nationalists, uh, neo-fascists and ultra-nationalists, um, who then used, uh, and most Americans still believe that <laughs> the uh, shooting that occurred on the Maidan Square were, were, uh, was carried out by special riot police called the Berkut, ordered by Yanukovych to shoot on, the, on civilians, when in fact, as we now know, and it's been revealed uh, <laughs> in, in excruciating detail by Professor Ivan Kachanovsky, I wrote an article about it six years ago. He also wrote, he wrote an article previously before that, and he's continued to research it. And anyone who's interested in an objective view will uh, can go take a look at his research. And it's quite clear. And, and, and members and people who participated in these sniper shootings have acknowledged it. They've held interviews in the press in Ukraine and said that they, one of them said he was the first one to fire. Uh, so we had the neo-fascists and internationalists shooting at both the Barracuda police and the regular police and the demonstrators at the same time to spark outrage in the crowd that led to the storming of uh, government buildings, the over overthrow of Yanukovych. So it was basically a kind of false flag operation. I'm not one yet who believes that um, the United States uh, participated in the planning of that uh, false flag operation. Uh, there are some people who do. Um, but uh, either way, um, this, this foundational event in the formation of, of Maidan Ukraine, if we, want to, if we can call it that, uh, was essentially a terrorist attack, a false flag terrorist attack. And um, this is a, a problem. And the United States and, and the population is still in the dark about the reality of the situation. And if you take that into account, no wonder uh, one can not be particularly surprised that Putin then decided to retaliate in some ra fairly uh, aggressive way, as he did in uh, Crimea, and then support for the rebels in Donbass. Yeah. Um, so we can summarize that there are many aspects uh, leading to this conflict. There is a cultural, a historical, geostrategical, mm -hmm. uh, political, economical aspect of this conflict that led to this violent um, and um, um, and as you mentioned, um, um, the Maidan massacre. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I interviewed for almost two and a half hours uh, Professor Ivan Kachanovsky, 
And in this interview, he showed uh, this big amount of data, uh, forensic uh, evidence and uh, medical evidence reports, uh, eyewitnesses and so on and so forth. And also you quote uh, him in your book, uh, Ukraine over the edge. So it, it is, um, yeah, it is very important to, to, to mention this. Um, so uh, you also mentioned NATO expansion. It's, it's, um, it's very interesting story. Uh, now that the files are open um, with the Freedom of Information Act, uh, we saw that uh, it, NATO expansion began with a lie <laughs> because uh, um, after the Cold War, Yeltsin was led to believe that uh, NATO will not expand, expand uh, anymore and uh, that it will be more peaceful and maybe Russia would be integrated in this process. Mm -hmm. But this was uh, like, um, yeah, the archives show us that this is, it began with a lie. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also yeah important to mention this historical fact mm. that the NATO after the the fall of the Soviet Union lost his <clears throat> his purpose. And it was actually Gorb it was actually Gorbachev who received those assurances, um, not Yeltsin. So it was even before the Soviet collapse in 1990. We were giving these assurances that NATO would not expand be beyond the United Germany, um, and. Uh, the uh, bloc would essentially become more political than, than than military. And it was on the basis of this that uh, Gorbachev dissolved the Warsaw Pact. So, yes, uh, unfortunately, the things got off to a very bad start. <laughs> the uh, yeah. post-Cold War era got off to a very bad start with a, uh, a bomb created by the Cold War uh, trans <laughs> transported into the new post-Cold War era. And unfortunately, no one decided to uh, diffuse that bomb. Instead, the bomb keeps ticking and becoming more powerful. So it's a, a major problem and um, it could very well lead to a war at some point over Ukraine. I believe uh, um, it is called the Brzezinski prophecy uh, that the NATO expansion can lead to a, to a big war. Right. Yeah. Um, before but we go, Brzezinski actually, interesting enough, towards the end of his life, admitted that NATO expansion was a mistake. I believe he was already, even in fact, already on his deathbed when he made that claim. So um, even he began to, and he was one of the main proponents of NATO expansion, uh, began to understand that it was creating a very dangerous situation with Russia. And it would have been much, much easier to guarantee the security of the countries between NATO and, and Russia. Uh, in some other way other than provoking. And of course, we have new also, we have the um, documents that were released by, I believe it was the United States that released those new documents of the discussions between the stenographic reports be, um, <clears throat> of the discussions between Clinton and Yeltsin in the uh, uh, <clears throat> mid-90s. And it's quite clear, you you, you read the text and you re see Yeltsin literally begging, <laughs> literally begging Clinton not to do this because it's going to weaken his position at home. And probably he himself uh, had great concerns about having NATO spreading closer to the border, though, when he's talking to this, uh, talking about this with uh, Clinton, he's emphasizing that the problems that it will create for him domestically by uh, supporting the arguments being made by the former communists and um, their own nationalists, ultra-nationalists like uh, Zhirinovsky and so forth. So, uh, yes, it was a, a major mistake on and, and created many uh, negative side effects that we're uh, living and uh, hopefully won't be dying by in the next next few years. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's um, a sad story. Um, do you believe that uh, the Ukraine conflict is a proxy war between the great powers or is it a civil war? Um, how can we define this this conflict? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I would say it's it's a little of both, but primarily it begins inside Ukraine. Um, although certainly Putin's uh, move to annex Crimea uh, was also a major factor in. Well, it all begins really with the Maidan, right? It begins with Maidan because immediately after the illegal seizure on the Maidan. We begin to see the begin in um, eastern Ukraine similar events. They're basically copycat, copycatting, taking uh, revenge to protect themselves, 
from the new Maidan regime, which is predominated by these ultra-nationalists and neo-fascists as far as they can tell, or at least is potentially predominated by them. So the people in the East are concerned that the their very enemies inside Ukraine, from Eastern Ukraine, and we saw later that the entire new government of Maidan was dominated by people from Western Ukraine and people who wanted to erase the Russian language from Ukrainian life and so forth, that the people in the East had legitimate reasons to fear what was going on. And so they began to do similar things as uh, on Maidan. They began to protest. Uh, then they began to seize uh, local government buildings. Uh, in some of those cases, there were, those were armed groups. And in some of those cases, uh, there were probably were people who were backed uh, by people sent from Moscow, people like Strelkov and Girkin, but not in all cases. And there is no doubt that there would have been a backlash in the East no matter what. If Russia didn't exist, <laughs> there would have been a backlash in the east to what was happening in uh, Kiev, uh, controlled largely by Western, the Western U Ukraine. So that's one factor. Um, so, but uh, remember the uh, the other factor, important factor, is that Ukraine, uh, the Kiev, t Kiev took virtually no steps to negotiate with the people who were doing undertaking these actions in the east. Instead, in early April, they immediately declared an anti-terrorist operation, which was a declaration of war against these um, these people in the East. Now, of course, by that time, Putin had already annexed uh, Crimea, but part of the logic of, of, of annexing Crimea was that the people in Crimea were dead set against what happened in Maidan, and there was a very good likelihood of a civil war starting because they would have had to send um, uh, troops or, or uh, Maidan-based rebels, people from the various uh, neo-fascist groups, into uh, Crimea, there was a military. There was there were some military forces from Ukraine on Crimea. We remember there was a great confrontation between those troops, and luckily they didn't uh, end up they ended up not firing. Um, so, in some ways, so the, annex, the annexation of Crimea may have actually preempted a civil war, the beginning of a, a larger civil war, because you would have had one uh, between Crimea and then between the Don, Don, Donbas and Kiev. And that could have then drawn in many of the other regions in southeastern Ukraine. And that could have happened very quickly. So that by the summer of 2014, you could have had a major scale civil war instead of the isolated civil war in uh, in Donbass. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was uh, an explosive situation and almost every step had a negative side effect that had been taken by parties after the Maidan uh, uh, seizure. Um, when we look back at history, when we look back at, of course, recent history, um, when we um, observe what happened in Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, the so-called colored revolutions in Georgia and, and so on and so forth, uh, what we can see is a strategy. Uh, what we can see is a, a I believe um, the term is regime change. Mm -hmm. um, so this this is um, the strategy to overthrow a government that which is um, uh, um, which ideology or culture religion is opposed to the Western uh, values or Western interests. Um, I believe we can observe this. Uh, do you think that Ukraine is part of this strategy of regime change? Is it? like a new Cold War strategy, like in the past it was containment, George Cannon and his mm -hmm. containment strategy. Can we see that this changed and now it's um, a different strategy? And is Ukraine part of this new strategy that is called regime change? Absolutely, Ukraine's part of that. And I think it, it, it really uh, was inspired by um, the overthrow of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe uh, at the end of the... Uh, uh, Cold War in beginning you know, in 89, and they simply tried to replicate that model in the post-Soviet uh, era, uh, ignoring the fact that really in the communist countries it was really spontaneous. Um, there wasn't, you know, aside from things like Radio Liberty and so forth, uh, there really wasn't a major, there wasn't, there was no major financing of opposition groups, for example. Um, People were inspired uh, themselves to overthrow the communist uh, regimes. So in the in the, in the um, other post-Soviet cases and in the cases uh, in the Middle East and so forth, you have a 
very different situation in which you have regimes which uh, grew uh, in one way or another indigenously within those countries. Some some of those regimes having a large opposition, some not. Um, or some of those states having a very divided polities, as in the case of Ukraine. And so trying to um, replicate that uh, those events that occurred in Eastern Europe under communist rule at the end of the Cold War in those countries was a much more uh, was not low hanging fruit. It was a much more difficult uh, uh, task task to pull off. And one of the problems with, that I've always had with this uh, strategy is that. <clears throat> um, and if you read these texts uh, of, of people who write about this and some there sometimes they actually openly state that the goal of um, providing dem uh, democracy promotion assistance and market promotion assistance and so forth uh, is to create an internal crisis. A revolutionary crisis or pre-revolutionary crisis in these countries. And of course, as we all know from history, revolutionary crises end in, in various ways. Once you get to the stage where you have a, a, a pre-revolutionary crisis or a revolutionary crisis in which you have dual sovereignty, you have different groups with um, more or less uh, either pro-regime or anti-regime with approximately the same amount of resources and support, um, all bets are off. Anything can happen. There's no way to control the process. So it's a very risky um, endeavor. And we saw uh, Ukraine is probably the penultimate example in which the um, demonstration started out as, um, in my uh, normative opinion, uh, uh, legitimate demonstrations um, against the corruption of Yanukovych, the Yanukovych regime, um, disappointment over his decision not to sign the agreement with the EU, um, and uh, so forth. But quickly, uh, you had these ultranationalist and neo-fascist elements infiltrate the Maidan, uh, and then it, within the Maidan chaos in the square, able to organize uh, themselves separately and then organize this sniper's attack, which led to really what was an Ill illegitimate overthrow of the Yanukovych regime. Rather than having a mass um, uh, mass revolt led by, say, peaceful demonstrators, say, as in, uh, say, Czechoslovakia or negotiations um, between the opposition and the uh, regime, as was occurring, actually, there was an agreement, as we, we recall, on the 20th, 20th February agreement, the same day that the snipers massacre occurred. And letting that process play out, instead of that, we had a small group of radicals uh, overthrow the regime. So the regime basically, in many ways, if most Ukrainians understood, m many Ukrainians aren't aware <laughs> of the fact that, uh, in fact, it was the neo-fascists uh, uh, engaging in the gunfire. Um, the legitimacy of that regime would be uh, thrown into into doubt. And in fact, you know, objectively, it is a, a regime that has minimal, if any, legitimacy in, in historical reality and truth. Um, uh, it's another thing that right now the majority of the people support the regime, though very few people support the New Zelensky government who came to power. He came to power with uh, great popularity and he's in a very short period of time lost almost all of it. Um, so the, generally what you have is this, um, you know, a tendency, uh, this uh, tendency to in, in, in executing this strategy of uh, this risk of um, supporting an illegitimate regime or putting an illegitimate regime in power or, or a regime with minimal legitimacy that does not hold on to power very long. And we saw this very thing repeat in Ukraine in 2010 when you had the 2004 Orange Revolution and six years later Yanukovych came to power because it's a very divided country. Now it's less divided now because Crimeans and Donbassians don't vote. <laughs> so it's somewhat less divided, but still there are, there are major divisions in the country. Um, so it's a problem. I'm very glad um, that you pointed this out. I'm very glad that you mentioned this. Um, I wanted uh, to be clear, um, and I'm happy that you agree on this. Um, the overthrow or the, the wish, the public uh, uh, wish to um, overthrow a corrupt regime is a good thing. So right. the protest started uh, with a good um, incentive, with a good motive, but then it changed and history showed us that there is this neo-fascist involvement, right. there is foreign involvement, there are NGOs which are preparing 
uh, some sort of um, revolution. Right, that was the point I left, I left out, that the NGOs um, that were being financed by USAID and various uh, foundations that receive U.S. government funding um, supported uh, um, various groups, and those were the groups that sent people originally onto the square on the Maidan um, in legitimate protest against the Yanukovych regime. So it was not, it was in part spontaneous, but it was also something that was seeded by Western assistance. And if the goal is to create a revolutionary situation, well, they succeeded. <laughs> the problem is that it didn't play out perhaps in the best way. Yes. Another point that is um, worth to um, explain to our audience uh, is the question, why is the Ukraine important for U.S. interests? Because if we if we change the game and um, and um, if we understand what will the world, what will U.S. citizens think about if, for example, uh, Russian military forces or uh, political uh, diplomatic uh, uh, actors uh, are involved in, for example, on the near border uh, to the U.S. Um, <laughs> and uh, want to overthrow the regime in, for example, Mexico, Canada, and and. Uh, I I I I cannot understand that this is this should be normal to intervene in different countries to um, change the the rule of the game. It's it's like um, a continuation of colonialism, imperialism, as uh, Professor Roy Casagrande put it. And uh, yeah, it's important to understand this that intervention is is like a, another form of imperialism. Well, basically, I mean, it's a, <laughs> in a sense, it is a continuation of, or a, a form of imperialism. Uh, oddly enough, it really, um, in many ways, mirrors uh, the activity, not just of the United States during the Cold War, but of the Soviet Union, which also tried to um, seed revolutionary movements and have communist movements take power uh, in various places around the world. And in terms of the, the initial question that you raised, is this, is this in the interests of um, the United States? The, the question becomes, how do you define now American interests? Because I don't think you can point to a place on the globe where the United States, States uh, doesn't say we have vital security interests. Um, because as you continue to expand, again, it's this internal logic. As you continue to expand and you have a territory that's yours, either uh, member of NATO or an ally supporting American policy in general, anywhere around the of world, influence. you then then try to um, expand that to the neighboring countries, because the country that uh, the countries that now are part of your um, uh, your block, put it to put it uh, generally speaking, um, uh, are vulnerable to these countries that are not in the block. <laughs> and so it leads to an internal e eternal NATO and Western expansion. And at some point, um, it's going to clash with any great power that's outside of uh, the bloc. And so we're seeing that the result now is uh, the, the, the new Cold War, in which you have the world again divided into two, essentially two parts, at least the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the United States NATO-led uh, democratic uh, elements, which in foreign, foreign policy don't behave themselves all that democratically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the more authoritarian regimes who are actually, for, in terms of their own future um, growth as powers, to, to be sure, uh, but also in terms of their own national security interests, would like to see some kind of uh, an agreement in terms of, generally, uh, it's going to come down to, it would have to come down to an, a, a uh, agreement about spheres of influence. In, in, essentially, that's what we'll have to come down to. And the question is, will the United States at some some point, given that its power is declining, uh, agree to um, some kind of negotiations in, uh, on, that, on, that, on that fundamental point so that these uh, conflicts um, on the border regions between the different blocs don't turn into uh, major wars? Uh, there has to be established essentially a new order because right now we have chaos in the post-Cold War era. 
I understand you, yes. Um, um, the professor um, Edward Lozanski, which I interviewed uh, yesterday, was talking about the logic behind NATO expansion and he mm -hmm. quoted uh, George Cannon um, and he quoted uh, President, former President uh, Eisenhower uh, with uh, the term military industrial complex. So uh, this is the logic uh, why NATO uh, and the military has to expand. I believe uh, it's like one billion, no, uh, one trillion. Uh, the 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 amount that the U.S. spent um, on military um, equipment and and other stuff, um, and they they the U.S. I believe have um, nearly 1,000 naval and other bases, military bases around the world. So it's a huge uh, empire, and the logic behind this uh, it's like yeah, like uh, the term said it everything I believe the military industrial complex. So the industry and the military. Uh, combined uh, uh, want want to grow and it's <laughs> right. yeah so this it's is a major problem and of course there are other industries that that benefit from um, the uh, overwinning American presidents uh, presence in uh, various regions the oil and gas industry and many many other industries um, uh, benefit by predominant American power in one or another uh, region or country. So there are many, many interests, um, uh, unfortunately, driving uh, this uh, this expansion, in which which has been in overdrive. But there, there is actually a natural end to all this, and that is that the um, uh, the American economy just can't cannot simply support um, this kind of. There is a limited amount a limited amount of economic benefit from. Um, from this kind of expansion because it creates so many it's, it's, it's a classic case of overextension of empire in which yes there are certain new markets and, and new profits that can be made and new influence but at the same time there are greater burdens that come along with it and that also require uh heavy financial <laughs> uh contributions and and the russia and the uh, the uh, the american economy basically has reached the point with if you look at the the national debt where we're reading, we're reaching the limit of how far um, uh, this can f further proceed without some kind of uh, moderation. Um, plus, when you add the fact that now there's a more, uh, well, I would say a quasi-socialist regime already in in power in um, Washington, they also want to spend huge amounts of money on ra various social welfare programs, programs for political correctness to defend to defend supposedly oppressed uh, minorities that actually are not oppressed anymore <laughs> uh, and so forth and so on uh, uh, and um, in fact they 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 tucked in the new uh, uh, infrastructure bill hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to go to various social organizations that support the Democratic Party so basically you have a regime that's now behaving itself like the Putin regime um, uh, and we can't afford we can't afford those two things. It's, it's just like the uh, end of the Soviet Union. It's uh, overspending on bread and butter, uh, on guns and butter, I should say. Too much money on both, and it's going to lead to uh, a collapse of the, the treasury and other things. Uh, so there is a natural limit. The question is, does the um, does the elite wake up before there's an economic crash, or they've created a um, they've helped create uh, a crisis abroad. That's the question. Mm. I agree. Um, I would uh, only add to this idea that, um, as Nancy Fraser uh, put it, uh, I believe it's this um, new type of progressive neoliberalism, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, big corporation occupied progressive ideas. I believe that uh, it's not the fault of, of this good ideas. I, I'm an anarchist and I believe in, in socialism and, and these values. Uh, but I believe uh, big tech corporations, Google and so on and so forth, use this new type of ideology, this this language. It's mm -hmm. on Vogue, uh, mm -hmm. uh, political correctness. They used it as an instrument. Mm -hmm. to manifest their their power 
So I believe uh, it's not the fault of ideas or it's not um, that the ideas are wrong. I believe they are good. It's it's good for for us to be equal. It's good. Uh, it's not it's nothing wrong with it. But uh, it's wrong if big corporations and like you said, the Democratic Party use this kind of idea, uh, and only on the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no significant change in the in the politics. So the poor are getting poor. So nothing changed really mm -hmm. uh, in the real world. Uh, maybe rhetorically, but not in the real world. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, this is mm -hmm. something that I wanted to add. Um, so, um, my next question is, uh, what is the role of the media in this war situation? Um, can we see a Cold War rhetoric? And uh, do you believe that is the media uh, objective uh, and... Could it be obje objective uh, in this case? Because the Russian side presented the facts differently um, and the, the Western media presented also the Ukraine crisis in a different light. So what is your opinion on the role of the media in this war? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest problem is that, that, that everybody is essentially uh, lying, engaging in propaganda and disinformation. Um, now, to some extent, that was true toward, during the Cold War, but generally speaking, uh, the West held to something more or less close to the truth. Uh, that's no longer true. <laughs> the West is now using propaganda just like the Russians, just like the Soviets, uh, in the same way, uh, both the, 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 the Biden administration is using it domestically and they're using it abroad. Um, the use of it abroad is something that's been going on for uh, quite a while and it's becoming more and more um, brazen. Uh, the, the extent to which the media uh, excluding the government now from the discussion for for a while, the extent to which the U.S. media is now willing to um, distort the truth uh, in order to either support the local the, the, the American administration um, or undermine the uh, American administration in the case of Trump uh, uh, and carry out the policy for basically the Democratic Party. Uh, which has a very anti-Russian point of view, um, is beyond all bounds, beyond, beyond anything we have ever seen in this country, far beyond anything we've ever seen in this uh, country. And of course, the, the the classic example is the Russiagate affair, right? Which we've we've seen uh, the Steele dossier completely unravel, completely discredited, something that was um, uh, paraded before the American people on all the news channels for three years, um, basically just to undermine Trump. I characterize what happened, basically what's happened since um, the Russiagate affair, including, by the way, the uh, hacking of the uh, Democratic National uh, Committee, which is far from a proven fact. Um, and it'll just simply we everyone, well, many people know, right, that the FBI actually never looked at the servers and the the claim that the Russians had hacked uh, the servers was made by a company hired by the Democratic Party that was very close to the Democratic Party and that the Democratic Party had a uh, veto and censoring power over what information was sent to the FBI, FBI in the report. So uh, uh, clearly we have no definitive proof that the Russians even hacked that. And there are actually studies that, sh that, sh that claim that show that the um, material that was hacked, uh, that was taken from the Democratic Party servers was taken um, on site, uh, loaded onto a, a, a flash drive. So, and in fact, the the executive director of CrowdStrike, which was hired by the Democratic Party, when he spoke in private said, we do not have, we do not have proof that the material was extricated from the computer. We have indications, we do not have proof. Um, so, that means a, a hoax essentially was foisted on the American people, something that drove a wedge, a further wedge, uh, drove the wedge further in, in between Russia and the United States, Russia and the West, uh, uh, on a false premises, on, on, on false premises. So I don't know what, uh, what, what more is there really to say? Uh, there are Cold War tactics, Cold War strategies, Cold War <laughs> propaganda. Uh, not much more to say. And it's quite funny, or we can put it in other terms, it's cynical or maybe it's uh, hypocritical 
because the U.S. is trying to overthrow governments around the world since the the, the, the Cold War, and it's quite funny that they are now <laughs> telling other countries, "Hey, you are in, intervening in our elections," and you are. <laughs> it's quite a yeah cynical and hypocritical uh, perspective on 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 one hand, and on the other hand, as you. Um, mentioned and you published recently an article on the Russia gate uh, and um, the evidence is clear that there is no Putin's uh, troll army and uh, there is no no collusion and on the contrary as uh, um, uh, the um, investigative uh, reporter and journalist which I um, admire Glenn Greenwald um, showed us uh, discovered uh, that there is evidence, on the contrary, that Clinton was involved in a in a in this. Uh... Oh, absolutely, absolutely, sure, sure. It came from the Clinton uh, Clinton campaign entirely. Uh, I'm also a big fan of uh, Glenn Greenwald, although he has different politics from me. I'm 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 a capitalist, free market uh, person. He's a he's probably more liberal, quasi socialist. I'm not sure really what, but he's clearly more on the left than I am. Um, uh, but he he's the important thing about Glenn Greenwald is he stands on the principle of uh, abiding by the Constitution, protecting uh, Americans rights and and telling the truth no matter who it hurts. Uh, and that's that's the most important thing. And if we can and you're beginning to see now, actually, in the United States to move away from the whole <laughs> moving a little bit away from. But this is important, obviously, that the internal situation in the United States is crucial for what's going to happen on the international stage. We're gradually beginning, very slowly beginning to see a people who are on the left, the few people on the left who remain, who support the Constitution and support freedom of speech and freedom of rights, because many, unfortunately, have, have turned against those principles because they want to bash conservatives. Uh, and the peop and people on the right who support the Constitution are beginning to come together. And, uh, for example, you'll see, um, you now see Glenn, Glenn Greenwald invited onto many um, radio talk shows and internet uh, talk shows that uh, most liberals consider to be, you know, it's like going on uh, Goebbels' uh, talk show. You know, he's. Um, I'm. I, for example, listen to Glenn Beck quite often. I disagree with him completely on on Russia and so forth, but on internal politics, I agree with Glenn Beck. Glenn Greenwald has gone on Glenn Beck's program, and they didn't disagree about a thing. They were in agreement 100 percent. And, and, and Glenn Greenwald, Greenwald and Beck are just one example. There, there's beginning to uh, emerge from both the left and the right a pro-constitutional position that is probably the only thing that's going to save this country from uh, de dissolving into a uh, civil war or some, some other major uh, domestic crisis. And of course, that will have profound influence on the situation abroad. So it's very important that uh, the United States gets back on its feet and returns to some of the old principles that the country was actually founded on. And actually, that's an important point, because one of the principles that sort of has been distorted, if you go back and you look at the revolutionary period in the United States, um, there was this dream that the American Revolution and democracy would spread all over the world. So we have this kind of messianism already built in to the American uh, spirit um, from the beginning. But the question is, um, Back then, they saw saw that um, ex expansion of democracy being uh, achieved through the model, through the American model. There would be no, because as you remember, the most of the um, uh, founding fathers didn't want the United States to get involved in European politics. So they saw the way that democracy democracy would spread around the world was by the perfection and the effectiveness and the humanity of the American constitutional system. And then that would serve as a model. And then peoples with their own internal political, political struggles over time would come to the to something uh, similar to the uh, American model. And, and that is what I think would be the best strategy for the United States would be to continue to propagandize the model, but do that without criticizing other countries and other cultures no less uh, getting involved in trying to overthrow other regimes. The only cases where I, I would support the idea of over, attempting to overthrow a foreign regime would be if that regime um, presented a clear, imminent threat to Western security or security of some other 
uh, country. Um, in that case, uh, I could see that. For example, I can see trying to do that in North Korea. I do, don't have a problem with trying to overthrow him. Problem is those totalitarian regimes are very hard to infiltrate and overthrow. So it becomes kind of a uh, circular problem that the, the very regimes that we, in, in my, according to my model, we would want to overthrow would become very difficult to would be very difficult to overthrow. But but then we can adopt the same strategy that we uh, adopted during the Cold War, and that is containment. So it seems to me that that would be a better strategy. It would be far cheaper. It would be far less destabilizing to the um, interna international order. Uh, it would facilitate. Uh, rather than alienation between East and West, more cooperation, which would facilitate trade. Instead of sanctions, we'd have more trade. The economies would be more robust. Seems to me that that would be a more logical model than engaging in all this uh, um, uh, revolutionary, quasi-revolutionary fomentation. Yes, I totally agree. Um, so let's summarize. Um, the, the the Russia Gate is the, a name for a conspiracy that right. which which uh, happened. Russia Gate uh, basically covers all of the uh, different conspiracies: the the Steele dossier, the DNC, the trolls, the trolls, the trolls. You made a point about the trolls. I just want to qualify that for a second. There were there was a troll army. <laughs> the thing is, it wasn't very big. It's not something uh, that really influenced the election at all. And second of all, we do the same things. Furthermore, Russia, if the Russians did create some kind of massive troll army, they'd simply be trying to, they'd simply be, it would be sort of like using, you know, the argument that some of the jihadi or other terrorists use is that we use terrorism because we don't have big armies. We don't have, it's the same thing, you know, they would use a troll army because we dominate the world media. Russia doesn't dominate the world media. It's the United States and the West that dominates the world media. So they use uh, a new, they use a new tactic on this, in this new medium, the internet. Uh, and it was not as large as they, as, as they claim. And in fact, a large portion of it seems to have been just to drive uh, clicks to uh, uh, produce profits for different sites. So it was completely overblown. It existed, but it was uh, insignificant. Yes, yes. So uh, we heard for, for many months and, and years uh, that Trump is the bad guy. Of course, I, as an anarchist, I believe, okay, uh, I don't believe in, in many things. Uh, I, I cannot agree with many things that Trump said or, or did. But on this case, I, I clearly see that this is a conspiracy to to um, uh, to, to damage uh, the image uh, uh, of Trump um, and to, to discredit him. So in this case, um, uh, like Russell Brandt, like Naomi Klein, like Grant Greenwald, uh, there is no political left and right. And I believe this division and this polarization of society uh, don't lead us to democracy because it it hurt it hurts us all because we cannot talk to each other without uh, being hysteric and and uh, shouting at each other and uh, yeah it it doesn't lead to to nothing. Mm -hmm. So. Despite, for example, we both uh, have different opinions on politics, we can agree on many things. We can agree on Russia, uh, Ukraine conflict, on the neo fascist coup attempt. We can agree on, yeah, many things Russia Gate and, and the, mm -hmm. the role of the media and so on and so forth. Yeah. And yes. so, yeah, this is, this is the, 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 what, what um, I believe media is lacking this perspective. Absolutely. It's yeah, one-sided. Is... It's one-sided. So you have yeah. this newspaper that is democratic for the Democratic Party. Then you have the other newspaper that is Republican. And you, have... <laughs> so it's like it's A team, A team and B team. And my team yeah. is always right. And uh, yes. it's very destructive. And it's the path. It is the path to civil war because um, increasingly both sides see the others in uh, the most extreme uh, form. Um, so it's a very, very uh, dangerous situation. The, the, the country just continues to keep being polarized. Um, how are people supposed to react, uh, people on the right, for example, when um, uh, this uh, guy Rittenhouse um, is put on trial for self-defense? Uh, and then the next day after he's uh, acquitted, 
Um, an African American drives a truck into a crowd of white um, Christmas parade paraders, uh, and the media, as soon as the media finds out that he was black, they stop talking about it. And before that, they were talking about Rittenhouse every day, all day long. And now they just drop it because he was black. If the guy who ran through the Christmas parade had been white and had run through a Christmas parade of black people, they'd be talking about it 24 hours a day. So how can people trust? And if people cannot trust the media, then they have no uh, objective sources of information to rely on. And they begin to be uh, to begin to believe in conspiracy theories more often and uh, more often than not. Um, people, the average person, you know, who works uh, eight, ten hours a day and then has an hour uh, commute home, does not have time to research every issue. And there are so many issues now being raised, whether it's the the FBI's involvement in uh, the January sixth events now that's coming to light. Uh, that Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald has talked about a little bit, but uh, other sites have, to, have revealed. Um, as far as I'm concerned, incontro incontrovertible information that the FBI basically um, uh, inspired the situation or in, uh, that led to the uh, Capitol, putting uh, informants who led the first groups that went into the Capitol, who were then followed by uh, the others from the crowd. Um, you know, from from that to the covering up what's happened in Waukesha with the attack on the Christmas Christmas parade to Russia Gate, and you just go on and on. And where are people supposed to uh, uh, find objective evidence upon which they can then have a normal civilized discussion and at times come to an agreement? <laughs> when you have both sides uh, believing in cons conspiracy th theories that are completely counterposed to the other conspiracy theories. It's just it's, it's a recipe for a social disaster. Yeah, and it's counterproductive for true democracy. Yes. Because in, in a true democracy, you have to debate. It's it's logical that we are different persons, different groups, this is different social aspects, cultural aspects, religious aspects. It's 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 clear that everybody has his opinion and, and mm -hmm. his values. And it's good to sit on a table and discuss these values and discuss, yes. okay, we as a society, where we should go, what is our future, and let's change the future. Yes. And we see contrary is happening um i can and, remember um, yeah i can remember when i uh, first started uh, becoming a soviet studies russian studies uh, um major when i was in uh, college in university and uh going to the 1986 i believe it was the 1986 triple a double s convention which is uh the convention of all the people who studied uh, the former soviet union and uh, Eastern Europe uh, and so forth, the American Association for Slavic, Slavic and uh, Slavic Studies, something like that, as I recall. They changed the name since then. And there was a de debate between um, Robert Conquest, who would be, you know, a representative of the, of the Hawks, who wrote um, the classic book on the Great Terror, and Stephen Cohen, who, who recently passed away, who is also more socialist oriented, who I had a, a very distant uh, relationship with, but we respected each other and he actually supported a lot of what I did. And we had completely different political views on, um, you know, domestic politics and socialism versus capitalism and so forth. Um, and they debated at the um, American. You couldn't you couldn't arrange that now anywhere. You couldn't you couldn't. I couldn't imagine, you know, uh, myself debating, say, uh, I don't know, trying to think of a Edward Lucas, for example. They wouldn't, people just uh, don't want to, people don't want to have their ideas tested by having to face an opponent and engage in a civil debate, right? You can, it's just not possible anymore because people are so agitated and propagandized um, that they can't carry out a civil conversation and they don't want to. So no one wants to organize that kind of a discussion. And it's uh, actually a very bad thing because it would be a good way to flesh out you know, some of the uh, misconceptions on both sides and maybe find some areas where we can come to an agreement about, say, on this issue of how we deal with uh, Russia and Putin. Yeah, and uh, it's important to understand that it's more convenient uh, to be in this bubble, to be in this uh, echo chamber, to, to, to hear no matter what you say, no matter uh, how false it is, 
to say yes you are right and and yeah. <laughs> it pushes your ego and it That's makes right. you feel better and right. and this is this is the problem of social media also this technology of algorithms and this new um yeah it, it's it's quite dangerous uh, on the joe rogan show there was um this guy who worked for um, i believe he worked for google uh tristan harris i believe uh he he were, uh, his name was tristan harris i believe and uh, he said that yeah uh, there is astonishing evidence that they manipulate our they manipulate our um, opinion and that they try to navigate uh, public opinion and so on and so forth so yeah it's it's quite uh, it's quite uh, tragic also for our democracy mm -hmm. and um, let me quote a, a left uh, philosopher a Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek who uh, pointed out that the left is also hypocritical in the sense that um, if for example a German or an Austrian is a nationalist he's the bad guy but we celebrate nationalism, for example, in Africa, or if a minority wants to be like a nation state, oh, let's celebrate it. And so uh, the left is also hypocritical in, in yes. many in many regards. So uh, it's it's worth uh, to 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 point this out because you you um, mentioned uh, this drama uh, with the black guy uh, killing um, people and um, hurting people. Um, yeah, it's it's like um, th th this is uh, the same thing I, I uh, because um, with Nancy Fraser's uh, term progressive neoliberalism because I believe nothing in the world changed the situation didn't change for black people I interviewed uh, Cynthia McKinney and uh, she told me that under Obama for black people nothing really changed so and and this is uh, the same principle the poor are getting poorer the richer are getting richer. So nothing changed for black people, for homosexual people. And yeah, it's it's quite amazing that uh, the left especially believe in, in these words. They don't see the 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 the, the change or, or the, the yeah, uh, what is going on in the world. They believe just in words, but words are not enough. Um, so, yeah, um, well, because they're basically using they're using black people for uh, political purposes. They're not they're not interested in in solving problems, they're interested in um, uh, uh, gaining political power, and that's that's what it's all about. And there's a lot of hatred too. There's a lot of emotional hatred to people towards people on the right because they're seen to be uh, fascists and racists and so forth and so on, and that wh whips up emotion. Um, they don't want to on the left side. They don't don't want to acknowledge that there really is virtually no more race. There is virtually no more racism in the United States on on, on the on the part of whites against blacks. In my opinion, there's far more racism coming from blacks against whites now. And we can see this in, in the new critical race theory that's being uh, foisted on uh, young children at the age of six and seven. They want to teach critical race theory in schools, teaching uh, little white boys and little white girls that they're, they're inherently racist. I mean, this is absurd. Um, and this, this attitude is spreading throughout um, various professions in the United States. For example, um, the main uh, Journal for Psychoanalysis uh, published an article on so-called on the title of the article is on whiteness, and uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's it's actually maybe been worse than than the way I para, para, paraphrase it, depending on how it comes out. Basically, it says white people are genetically racist. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a condition that's untreatable. Okay, <laughs> I mean, and this is in the 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 main journal of the American Psycho, uh, Psychoanalysis Association. I mean, this is a professional view now of psychoanalysts. And, and now they want to put this in the, in the schools. What is this going to do to society? I mean, this is, this is outright fascism. It's what it is. It's, it's, it's simply fascism. It's call it what it is. It's fascism. <laughs> I agree. I agree with you that that this point of view is ridiculous. It's ridiculous to say that this is a genetic. Uh, <laughs> the, and, and even uh, if gen even if they said it was cultural, racism. it's simply not true anymore. Americans Americans generally speaking <laughs> are very tolerant of uh, people, and in fact, most of the in, in fact even during the uh, before the civil rights movement, almost all the racism was in the South. There were very few people who were racist in the North. There were some, and there were certainly far more people who were white racists in the North than there were black races then. Um, uh, 
Uh, but that's basically in the north, it's 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 uh, completely disappeared. And in the south, it's almost completely disappeared. And I, you, you can't even if you had racist uh, sentiments, if you make them now, you're immediately going to be fired. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to uh, lose your per- career, um, lose friends. Uh, but that's not true on the other side. If you're a black racist who says terrible things about white people, nothing happens to you. In fact, you're likely to get promoted. <laughs> I believe I believe uh, it's a complex uh, topic because on the one hand, I can see uh, structural racism and structural sexism. Uh, if we uh, um, look at the aspect of privileges, of course, the richest persons uh, are men. And the richest guys are white, older uh, men. It's 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 a simple fact, and the structure is made to um, this is my opinion to privilege them more. And uh, this is a power structure, I believe, that is made from colonialism to imperialism to exploit others. And it's a convenient instrument. Uh, then back then in in history, it was uh, in the time of colonialism. It was a, a, a easy instrument to say, okay, they are black, they are not like us, they are not uh, intelligent, they are emotional. So we have to colonialize them, we have to educate them, and of course, with this uh, mentality, uh, it goes that okay, we can exploit them. Uh, they are our slaves. So I believe it it is a historical part of white people. But not only white people suppressed others, there are black people who suppressed other black peoples. So in, in my opinion, it's very complicated. There are men who suppress men. Older men are suppressing younger men and so on and so forth. So and um, it's it's also I believe both sides are wrong. If you are one sided and believe that only there is a structure and this is a structural problem, it's also false because there is this human human emotion and and of course there is there are black people who hate white people and so on and so forth so you cannot uh, you know um univer- uh, this universal statement that all whites are wrong or all blacks are wrong it, it's clearly false on the other side to pathologize and to 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 state like okay it's um it only only this one guy is sick or it's uh, he's a racist it's also false because there are structural the cultural influences who made this guy a racist who made this guy a bad guy uh, for example um there is a clear evidence statistic um that poor people in america are mostly uh, black And so that's why they are in jail. So this is a cultural thing. This is a structural thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to educate them. You have to spend more money there. Mm -hmm. So here comes the concept of a welfare state Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a quite uh, complicated story. It it um, depends on how you, you define structural uh, racism. If you just simply define it as um, uh, the, many of the rich people being um, or most of the rich people being uh, white uh, and so forth. Well, that's virtually meaningless because that has his historical roots. Uh, there are now many, many um, rich black people. And in fact, if you look at the statistics comparing um, uh, white rich people and black rich people, um, you will quickly find out that The great, the greatest discrepancy, for example, they, they usually dis- describe about the per capita wealth between whites and blacks. If you look at that issue, um, you'll find out that the reason why there's such a great disparity is because there's a big difference between very rich white people and very rich, rich black, black people. That accounts for most of the difference between the uh, cumulative wealth between black and white people. Um, there's always going to be poverty. My argument has always been um, to deal with the, the, the legacy, the, the, the legacy of slavery, of slavery is that more people, uh, more black people are poor than there should be naturally. Right. Um, this is this is this is uh, without a doubt uh, true. My argument has always been rather than creating this huge, massive welfare state that helps um, mothers at this stage and 
and distrib redistributes uh, money between black communities and white communities. So it would make much more sense to um, institute a little, I would be willing to institute a little piece of socialism in one place at, in the, in the uh, preschool and primary school system. And that would be that um, all the tax money that goes to um, uh, local school systems throughout the country be pulled into one pool and divided evenly. So that for the first uh, uh, 14 years or so of uh, a child's uh, uh, life, he's starting out in equal conditions. Everybody's going to schools of basically the same quality, uh, with the same amount of resources, quality of teachers and so forth. After that, you're on your own. <laughs> After that, capitalism freedom kicks in. We'll give you a good start because that's made basically where the problem lies. The, the, the problem lies in the period before, especially we talk about young black males when they hit uh, puberty uh, and they have that energy and drive and they haven't developed habits because they're going to bad schools. They haven't developed habits of studying of understanding the benefits of learning and the and the pleasure of learning and becoming more competent in things like that. Instead, in the black community, there's a culture that's anti-intellectual, anti-learning, completely anti. It also it also exists somewhat in the white culture nowadays, too, in the United States. But it's very and is also a very um, uh, self-alienating culture in that um, if you join white society, you're considered to be a traitor by the black community. Uh, and these 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 things need to be broken, absolutely have to be broken. And in this, I agree that for a period of time, it would be a good idea to create uh, equal conditions uh, in the schools so that people get off to a, a good start. After that, I believe socialism, any kind of socialist measures become extremely ineffective. They're counterproductive. Um, but certainly at that at that age, I think there's a great cost. Uh, uh, cost uh, benefit to, to doing this. Yeah, yeah, I agree on you. Um, capitalism could not function without uh, uh, um, at least a small portion of socialism mm -hmm. because there will be civil war if, mm -hmm. if there is no um, mechanism that supports uh, the poor class. So um, yeah, you have to, to have some sort of welfare state or mm -hmm. welfare mechanism. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, it will be uh, chaos and um, crime and, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's go back uh, to my last question. Uh, let's go back to geopolitics. And mm -hmm. um, um, do you believe that um, this uh, new Chinese, uh, it, it's not that new, um, One Road, One Belt initiative um, could change the girl strategical chess game? Uh, can we see, can you observe um, this Russia, China, Iran alliance or partnership uh, on one hand and this other, uh, the, the NATO states on the other hand, that this could be a new clash, a new Cold War, um, or is it just a hoax? Um, no, I think it's a, uh, well, there is definitely already forming a cold, uh, there is a new Cold War basically between cr crudely putting it East and West. Um, I think that the, the, the Silk Road is a, is a mechanism for expanding Chinese power and to the extent that that's going to create problems with the West, not necessarily, but it could. Um, it could contribute to the uh, intensification of, of the new Cold War. Um, Especially, this would be especially true, I think, if the Chinese began to be very successful, uh, and their allies were began to be very successful in 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 the South, um, uh, and began to wean away from the West, uh, large uh, portions of countries in the South, Africa, and so forth, and so on. So uh, that would create also greater pressure on the West, which would create. Uh, greater tensions. On the other hand, I mean, according to the logic of globalism, right, <laughs> the idea is that the economies economies of the world are going to become more integrated, the world's becoming more integrated. So this fits right into uh, the logic of globalization. The 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 only uh, dissent from that concept is the fact that it's not being led by the West, it's being led by the Chinese. Uh, <laughs> I, w I, I would recommend that we, if the West wants to counter in a peaceful way, the logic would have been, and we should have done this 20 years ago, we should have uh, began to build a uh, northern Silk Road. 
And that would have you know, building, for example, a tunnel between um, Russia and Alaska. So you would create a, a, a transport corridor all the way from London to Washington, D.C. But no, that wasn't done. <laughs> Instead, we decided to expand NATO. Um, it seems to me that that would have been a much more uh, fruitful endeavor. Uh, and it still would be beneficial to try to do it. But of course, relations between Russia and the United States are so bad now that it's, that's impossible to even consider such a thing. Um, that would be a much more uh, logical approach. This, and I would also say, why not? And, and through uh, some kind of Northern Silk Road, you could actually have the West begin to participate in the Chinese Southern Silk Road. So the countries would be, I mean, there's no reason why we cannot compete and in, even intensively compete, but at the same time, of course, there have to be mechanisms as well to, to there have to begin talks and negotiations about containing um, conflict, at the, especially at the different hot points around the world, Ukraine and Taiwan and so forth and so on. Um, if those two things were done, then we could manage this, this, this uh, transition from the unipolar world to a bipolar or a multipolar world more uh, confidently and without risk. Unfortunately, in, in Washington, there's no there's no new uh, thinking whatsoever. It's the same old uh, Cold War um, processes, uh, and it's uh, it's counterproductive, counterproductive for the West and counterproductive for world uh, stability. Yes, I uh, totally agree. Uh, we spoke about the social division, not only in the US, not only because of social media, the division between political left and political right. And there is also this division or polarization that begins with uh, George W. Bush when he quoted, uh, there is this axis of evil and uh, we are the good ones and they are the bad ones. And uh, these countries who, um, who are not with us are immediately against us. So mm -hmm. they are immediately our enemy. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we can also see a, a, um, a polarization of, of geopolitics. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is also quite amazing. It's a phenomenon that is and also course, leading us to nowhere. Of course, it's interesting, too, because when he said that, uh, Russia was in the process of being the first country that contacted uh, Bush after 9-11, offering, offering support. They offered the northern route to trans transport uh troops and equipment through Russia to help the United States fight in Afghanistan. And yet the uh, response from the West was uh, uh, we pulled out of the ABM treaty and we continue to expand NATO. <laughs> so so even in the case of Russia, if you cooperated, it didn't matter. You still got treated the same as you had been treated before. So it was uh, the worst of all worlds, generally speaking. Yes, yes. And um and in fact, uh, in Yemen, uh, we see the tension between Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, the Gulf region and Iran on the one right. side. Then you see Afghanistan, Iraq on the other side. Then you see Ukraine, Georgia, Abkhazia, uh, all these little conflicts and so on and so forth in, in uh, I believe, in Moldova. And um, yeah, there are many, many uh, regions, crises. There are many breaks, so to speak. And the, here we can see definitely like a line, like a border to, between the two blocks and they are colliding. And of course, we saw this uh, mm, uh, muscle game of, of uh, I believe, Trump um, who sent a, a fleet um, in the Chinese uh, sea, um, the Spartley Islands, mm -hmm. I believe it was. So we can see this tension is growing between US and and, and not only Russia, but, but also China. Uh, the, the China. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's frightening. It's it's mm -hmm. absolutely frightening. And um, and it's another yeah. cost of NATO. It's another uh, tragedy of NATO expansion in that if um, we hadn't expanded NATO without Russia, if we had brought Russia into NATO in some way or some form over the last 20 or 30 years, we could have developed a very good partnership with Russia. And that would mean that um, a, chi a China that, if it got overly aggressive, would have to fa face the prospects of a two-front uh, war or two-front conflict, because they would have Russia to its uh, west, and they would have the United States and uh, Australia and so forth and so on, and Japan um, uh, to the uh, east. 
And uh, this would have uh, made them think twice about being overly aggressive in the in the South uh, China Sea. And at the same time, we would ne not necessarily have to be using only military means uh, uh, to contain them because there would be more leverage for diplomatic uh, um, solutions to the problem. The, 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 the thing that really does concern me is that there doesn't seem to be any real solution to either the Taiwanese problem or the Ukrainian uh, problem um, in the uh, short or even midterm. I mean, these are problems. Uh, the Taiwanese problem is something that seems to be almost unsolvable, be, insolvable, because we have a commitment by treaty to defend Taiwan, and the Chinese <laughs> want Taiwan back. So I can't, unless the only uh, the only option would be, the only way out, and of course, again, this would be take decades long, would be if China began uh, to democratize, and then at some point, the Taiwanese would be willing to vol voluntarily rejoin China, which, again, would take uh, decades and even even decades into the future, it seems to be a bit pie in the sky. But uh, it seems to be the only, uh, either that or the status quo, muddling through with the status quo. Those are the only two peaceful options to resolving the problem. It, it, it's only uh, it's it's funny because in in uh, in a podcast um, uh, from Joe Rogan uh, there was this um, they discussed uh, Taiwan and they discussed that uh, the Hollywood movie I believe Too Fast and Too Furious and this one guy uh, I could not remember was it the director was it the the um, uh, anyways uh, and uh, in in one um, statement uh, he. He said that uh, first we will publish uh, our film in Taiwan and afterwards, because uh, China was investing hundreds of millions in this movie and afterwards he uh, apologized officially and, and he was <laughs> almost crying and apologizing to the Chinese regime. And this is the logic that we are in. Uh, corporations and media and, and film industry is because of money <laughs> involved in different ideologies in different uh, regimes and it, it, yeah it's it's quite funny uh that he has to apologize to a different country and and he's a yeah yeah it's 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 funny um and um for that reasons um i'm a big fan of ron paul not because i'm i i share his uh, political views on on many issues i disagree with him but in my opinion, he's a peace activist, and um, of course, I would I would wish that Tulsi Gabbard uh, would be the next president. But <laughs> this is uh, not dreamy. <laughs> this is unlikely. Yeah, this is my wish. <laughs> well, only, only if she becomes a Republican, maybe she's got a chance. <laughs> but I believe I believe uh, you would agree that Tulsi Gabbard uh, would be a good president on many on many regards. Um, on foreign on foreign pol policy issues, I generally uh, agree with her. Probably on domestic policies, I would I would not agree with her. Um, but even on even even on issues as, as we talked about before in terms of media objectivity and constitution and so forth, actually she's she's being very uh, constitutional. So on that uh, we agree. Um, again, all points of view should be allowed to be expressed. I I don't care if someone's a communist, a socialist, uh, an atheist. I'm not religious, but uh, so I have no particular gripe against atheist people. But uh, uh, the, you know, the more the merrier, as long as we don't do things that are illegal and violent. That's uh, that's the most important thing, and we can have interesting discussions and still uh, disagree. Uh, and <laughs> seems to me that's a much more better uh, better way. It's a better way to go for all of us uh, yeah. that route yeah. rather than uh, picking up guns. You would think that. Russian history would have taught us a little bit, a little lesson about that, right? And I think that's that's one of the lessons, at least, that Putin has correctly drawn from Russian history, is uh, uh, he's been um, at the on the one hand he's he's critical of uh, Lenin and the Marx and the and Marxism uh, and so forth, uh, but at the other hand he doesn't demonize it. He only brings up the subject when somebody asks him. But he's not obsessed with this issue constantly, even though one of the um, quasi opposition parties is the Communist Party, which is occasional is occasionally is critical of him. Um, he doesn't pick this uh, pick constantly pick this fight with um, people who are on the left. Um, and that would be, uh, you know, I think largely a good thing to to stay away with, stay away from. But unfortunately, in the West, that's become absolutely in, impossible now. Uh, 
Uh, and he has this idea basically of creating, um, and it's not a new idea, it's uh, an idea that, that you can find in, in fact in Russian philosophy going back uh, 100 years, is the idea of the, the totality of keeping a united history, that is respecting all the different parts of Russian history, even the, the terrible episodes like the Gulag and uh, the Great Terror and the, and the Civil War and so forth, and respecting it simply as your history. That doesn't mean you necessarily, if you're on the, if you're a capitalist, that you respect the Bolshevik point of view. It doesn't mean that if you're a Bolshevik, you respect uh, the White Army and the Tsar and so forth and so on. But it, what it does mean is that you have a respect that this is our common history, and we have to come to terms of it uh, with it, and we have to look at the truth, and we have to look at the bad and the good on both sides. Uh, and only then can we really develop, you know, a, a culture based on comedy instead of a culture based on uh, uh, conflict and um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the opponent as the, um, as the enemy. Yes. And by the way, I that totally. was the term, if we go back to American politics, it was, it was not a Republican. It was not George Bush who referred to um, in domestic politics his opponents as the enemy. The first person to, in public, refer to his opponents as the enemy was Barack Obama. <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speak, speaking to a Hispanic uh, uh, conference of some sort, I forget what the, the conference was about, um, um, and he, he referred to the Republicans as our enemies. And uh, this, I think this explains a lot about what happened with Russiagate <laughs> and the last uh, five years. Because I think he really did lay a bomb inside all these um, institutions by by a, a appointing at high levels people who were inveterate anti-Republicans and some people who were radically left and who wanted to violate the Constitution. And he put these people in place. And when they saw that Trump might actually uh, win, and of course, Trump has an image, right, that um, to some extent is true. I've never liked Trump when he was, even when he was younger, I was never, I don't like his um his uh, crude language, his uh, tendency to be aggressive, but a lot of it actually he he is uh, is is done with a from his point of view as humor. Not all of it, but some of it is done as humor uh, because he can he he's never been a get get away from the idea that he's kind of an entertainer. But I think this is also bad. A president shouldn't be um, shouldn't be non presidential in in order to be entertaining, um, and uh, he's very divisive in this way. Uh, but he never uh, referred. He never referred to people as their his his political enemies. He never went that far. Um, uh, and I, but I think that the fear of Trump and the the sort of distorted image of Trump, exaggerated image of Trump, who who's who's sufficiently bad enough in terms of the way I described him before. In policy, I largely agree with Trump. Um, but in terms of his personality, uh, you know, I find him kind of objectionable. Although I believe he is now beginning to realize that he is partially to blame, not entirely, um, but he's partially to blame for the polarization. And if you notice his last few interviews, he's been very peaceable. He's not in, engaged in any name calling. I think he's growing up. I think he's actually beginning for the first time to appear to be someone who actually is presidential, which from my point of view is actually not good because I don't want to really see him run for president again. I'd rather see someone like DeSantis run for president from the Republican side. Um, uh, a, because I think Trump is now getting uh, to be too old and probably under pressure, he might revert to the old Trump of calling people all sorts of names and so forth. So rather see him not run. But I do believe he's beginning to become uh, more mat mature, even at this late stage, or at least he's he's able to control himself in front of, in front of the camera. But that 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 radical image of Trump, I think, scared a lot of people on the left and led them to be more radical than they might otherwise have have been. I'm I'm very glad that you pointed out all these things, and I'm very glad that um, we both agree on on many things. Uh, it's 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 uh, um, the ability to uh, think for yourself. The ability is key. The ability to understand the context of a event, of a historical event, the ability to check the facts, and and of course it involves to have the time of course like you mentioned people are working for 10 12 hours a day they are tired they want to just zip or watch a tv show uh, that don't require any energy and i understand it but uh and of course there is this media clickbaiting 
and this <laughs> polarization of social media and we are the good ones, they are the bad ones. Of course, this led us to, to social division. But um, like we said, the ability to think your, for yourself is very crucial. So like on, on many things, you, we have to differentiate um, because, for example, you, you, you said that you are on, um, on the capitalist side. So, but you will agree with me that capitalism with this socialist democratic structure that we see uh, not only in Russia, but also uh, especially in China. This is not a, a human form. This is not a democratic form of, of capitalism. Right. So we agree that there must be a democratic structure. Then people should vote. People should be politically interested. Mm -hmm. There should be education. There should be some sort of welfare mechanism or welfare state. Um, that uh, brings people together, that, um, yeah, people can feel safe and um, develop their own thinking and, and um, yes. Um, or, for example, um, uh, Trump, um, there is this continuity in, in US history. Almost every president uh, waged war, did start a war, uh, illegally, unconstitutionally or constitutionally. And Trump was no ex ex exception uh, from this rule. So he also uh, uh, threw a lot of bombs, drone strikes, and so on and so forth. So there is an underlying structure. Uh, I believe you said it also in your book, uh, the so-called deep state. So there is a structure um, that is, um, yeah, that is controlling a segment of society. And um, like uh, in the beginning of this interview, uh, we said that this is the military industrial complex. So there is a structure that is, um, yeah, that is involved in, in many bad things. And also um, we can differentiate the thinking because I said that I'm an anarchist. But on the on the same on the same um, on the uh, in the same moment, I'm against Antifa. It's mm -hmm. it's it's quite funny because Antifa, in my opinion was instrumented uh, and I was also involved in, in, a, in a Bulgarian movement and I saw this with my own eyes that Antifa is uh, financed and, and <laughs> instrumentalized by some groups and, and some uh, for political motives mm -hmm. to, to disrupt uh, a regime or to, 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 to make a statement and, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm against Antifa, but I'm an anarchist on, on mm -hmm. a idealistic point of view because mm -hmm. I'm against hierarchy. I know this is idealistic mm -hmm. and maybe it's not realistic, but um, it's I believe it's like a religion. It's my opinion and mm -hmm. I believe it uh, society will be better off if you don't have states, if you don't have uh, military equipment mm -hmm. and yeah, but <laughs> it's wishful thinking maybe. It's, um, it's we're, a long, we're a long way from that. Um, I wanted to make one point about um, Trump and going back to your I didn't write about the deep state, but there is, um, and there was, there probably was a kind of a deep state that many people here on the right didn't want to um, recognize until the until the left took control of the deep state, and <laughs> and now we see that there actually is a deep state, and that's actually one of the things that's bringing might bring help bring um, people who are more uh, democratically oriented, uh, constitutional oriented together. Um, so there's this immen uh, incredible immense pressure. Uh, on a, any president coming from um, the intelligence organs and the and the military and f so forth and so on, to be somewhat more aggressive in in defending in Russian American interests than one might normally be. So in the case, uh, I think this was a double problem for Trump because Trump came to power, and I really don't think he knew a heck of a lot. Just like Obama, neither neither one of them knew a lot about foreign policy and about international relations. And um, Trump, I think, was in a position of uh, coming to power and the entire uh, deep state now transformed by Obama. The D I call it the DP state, the Democratic Party state. <laughs> the Democratic Party state, which now controls it, um, was out to get him. And the main reason was is because, uh, well, first of all, because uh, he might uh, at some point expose what Obama, what Biden was doing when he was the vice president some of the problems that Hillary had with Benghazi and Obama, so forth with Benghazi. Uh, then the Russia gate thing could be exposed because they began with the Russia gate thing. So they really needed to get Trump. And but the original, I think one of the original impeti, impeti for 
moving against Trump was the fact that he was open to the idea of having better relations with uh, Putin. The problem is because he didn't really understand foreign policy, international relations, he didn't really have a well worked out strategy, no less tactics about how to go about improving relations with Russia in an extremely complex situation. He simply didn't have it. Uh, so when he was confronted by the TP state, he had nowhere to go. He was uh, intimidated. He was countered inside the bureaucracy by different forces. And um, he couldn't really accomplish anything, all, all, also because relations were so spoiled by that. And then, and then you add on the, uh, the image that the population had because of Russiagate, right? It worsened relations and wor worsened the image of Russia beyond all sense of reality. Um, so that was a major problem. When Trump first came to power, my um, I think I actually wrote about this somewhere in one of the articles on my site, that I expected Trump would be bad for foreign policy because he was inexperienced, but he would be good for the economy. And that's actually how things turned out to be. If it hadn't been for COVID, Trump would be remembered as probably the greatest uh, president in terms of reviving the American economy, even greater than Reagan. Um, so, uh, but COVID, uh, COVID then is... Uh, destroyed that uh, all the gains that he had made in the economy in the first um, three years of his administration. Um, so, yeah, it turned out to be uh, a very mixed bag for, for Trump. And unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's become a pattern in which we um, tend to elect. If you look ever since, if you look at the Cold War, we've only really had one president who had any experience in foreign policy. And even his experience in foreign policy was indirect, and that was George Bush the Younger, right? Because he had experience, some experience through his father's experience. Uh, but all the other presidents had, had none. I mean, Clinton was a was a governor from Arkansas, so he wasn't even from a state that, you know, had a lot of uh, foreign ties and so forth and so on. So it's a very, that's also a major problem now, is we have a lot of um, presidential candidates who, who don't know uh, international relations, they don't know the world, uh, Trump's business, not, not even Trump's business, um, gave him an, a close acquaintance with international relations. So it's a problem. And uh, and uh, Biden, Biden is, of course, now is an exception. Unfortunately, Biden is nearly, nearly completely debilitated. And I don't think that he's really running the show. Um, he's being manipulated by uh, other people, uh, Susan Rice and... Um, uh, Kamala Harris, probably to some extent, but probably more Obama and Susan Rice and so forth and so on. So it's sort of a second, it's a third uh, Obama administration in many ways. Yeah, it's amazing what happened, what, what is happening, yes. And um, yeah, maybe uh, my final words, um, like uh, we said and we talked about your book, uh, Ukraine Over the Edge, um, just because we point out um, the facts and uh, this new fascist involvement and um, this doesn't make Putin a good guy or this doesn't uh, mean that we are uh, puppets, Russian puppets, or that doesn't mean that we are sympathizing with the Russian regime. And it's it's this simplistic way of thinking, ah, okay, he's critic of the Ukraine uh, war, ah, okay, he must be a Russian puppet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this this uh, simplistic uh, way of thinking, I want to deconstruct, and uh, here we totally agree with each other. Um, and I think um, one of the best uh, journalists or YouTuber who, who has done a lot of good work is Russell Brand. Uh, he's also he in my opinion he is the political left uh, why i'm saying this because he's critic uh, critical to the democratic party he's exposing all the frauds and 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 uh, conspiracy that is going on with facebook he's also critic of the uh, on vogue culture mm -hmm. and in my opinion this is the the true political left that mm -hmm. what we see is not the political left this is the instrumentalization of the left rhetoric of of just, just they're just words and um yeah so um i believe um yeah <laughs> um yeah <laughs> we yeah i think that uh, um getting back uh wanted to make a point about putin yeah putin you know i've written a lot about putin uh he's basically a softly a soft authoritarian who's now becoming more mid-range 
authoritarian, but he's still very um, surgical and careful about how far he um, uh, represses the opposition. Um, some of the things that have been, have been attributed to him um, should not should not have been attributed to him. But what he's what has been attributed to him is enough that we can say for sure he's not a democratic leader. He's an authoritarian leader. But, you know, mo most countries in the world are authoritarian and we have relations with many of them. There's no reasons why we can't. There's no reason why we can't have a normal relationship with Russia. Of yes, course. there'll be probably more tensions with Russia than that we will be with some other countries. But the level of tension now is completely unnecessary. It's completely artificial. It's manufactured. Uh, and we've dro we've driven Russia into the arms of the Chinese. Um, Let's and remember we've made it more difficult. We've made it more difficult for Russia to become a democracy because the tradition in Russia is that the elite, the elite closes ranks against opposition and tries to create greater unity by coercion and force when the relations with the West are bad and when they feel that there's a potential threat abroad. And as we gradually expanded NATO and increased our criticism of Russia and engaged in color revolutions, uh, that elite has basically closed in around. Putin is a is a um, is not the cause of the current situation. He's a symptom of the situation. <laughs> and for Russia to democratize, we're going to have to have some kind of thaw in the relationship. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Uh, let's remind our audience uh, uh, that, uh, yes, the U.S. Uh, is very uh, hypocritical uh, in this sense because uh, they um, may be uh, one of the, the, the um, uh, big partners uh, in U.S. foreign policy is Saudi Arabia, this theocratic and Wahhabit, uh, Wahhabit uh, bistic, uh, regime or clan, mm -hmm. a family uh, clan. So. Uh, yeah, on one hand, these are the good guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Well, there is no feminism there. Let's remind Hillary yes. Clinton <laughs> that they, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, there is no feminism. <laughs> there are no rights for gays. There is uh, no. <laughs> absolutely. So, so uh, yeah, I think people ought to think about that a little bit because, you know, for example, there was a, a campaign a while back in the, in the press saying that, you know, um, there's a discrimination against gays in Russia. Uh, the only law that relates to gays in Russia, for example, there were rumors that the, uh, a law had been passed saying that gays couldn't drive. And this is completely false. There was no law ever even there might have been a law introduced to the Duma, but it was never passed. Uh, I never actually saw that there was a law, but there might have been. I might have missed it, but perhaps there was. They, lots of people introduced all sorts of crazy laws in many parliaments, particularly in the Russian parliament. So uh, that's... Uh, not surprising. The only law that was passed was that you can't propagandize homosexualism in schools. Uh, that's a completely different issue. Um, if you look at the the state of uh, the rights of gays in society, um, it largely is a local issue. That is, generally speaking, the Russian population is not particularly tolerant of homosexuals. That's true. So Putin is not driving that. It's something that comes from uh, Russian society. The, uh, and the next church. Issue, huh? Uh, the church to some extent, yes. The church, yes, to some extent, is absolutely true. So, um, uh, and the other issue, of course, is that uh, depending on the locality, for example, if, if a bunch of uh, neo-fascists or thugs beat up a gay person on the street, in almost all cases, um, those people would be arrested you know, and, and um, convicted with uh, with something. But given the relative tolerance in the West, in Russia compared to the West of, of gays, there will be more circumstances where people who do that will not be punished. That's a problem, right? But that's nothing compared <laughs> to Saudi Arabia, where the state, if it finds out you're gay, will behead you. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's be clear. These are two, this is uh, black and white. This is already a black and white world. Two completely different uh, universes. So, uh, so why you would pick uh, on the issue of gays, the the problem of gays in Russia, and not talk about the the problem of gays in in in, in most of the Muslim world, uh, is beyond me. Yeah, and uh, um, I don't remember the 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 name of the author, but there is this book, Homo Nationalism, and I believe uh, this feminist author. 
um, uh, pointed out that there is this strategy of mobilizing homosexuals in order to to push your own political agenda. So yes. this is this is the problem that we are facing. I'm a big proponent of this um, um, theory of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. I'm a feminist and, and queer feminist, and uh, I believe in these values. But we 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 don't we we have to keep in mind that there is this trap, and um, yeah, we should we should um, be aware that. Um, People are talking a lot, but mm -hmm. they are maybe instrumentalizing this this topics uh, for their own personal gain, and, and they're, they're yeah. weaponizing they're weaponizing this issue and feminism. Yes, they're weaponizing the gain issue, feminism, and race all together. Uh, when in fact, in many cases, not all, so in many cases, that's not what they're after. They're either yeah. after they're purely after political power, or some other goal, some maybe economic uh, socialist goal. But they're not really interested in these uh, identitarian issues. It's just a tool. Well, but and this is not unusual, right? Lenin did the same thing during the Russian Revolution. Lenin uh, recommended that the uh, Bolsheviks and the other socialists make alliance with the uh, national liberation movements in Russia, with the Armenians and with Jews and Poles and so forth, Ukrainians. So this is not um, this is not anything new. It's the so-called cultural Marxism is. Is actually has roots going back uh, to Lenin in many ways, somewhat different, but quite similar. Yeah, identity politics. I, I talked uh, with uh, feminist scholars and they agreed uh, on this, uh, that this is a, a huge problem. So mm -hmm. it's not a problem. Uh, I, I want to mention this yes, once again. Show. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, my, my in, family I came home, so I had to uh, inform them I'm still doing the interview. Ah, okay. Yeah, we are we are on the end. So um, yes. Um, so uh, yes, this uh, issue with identity politics is a big problem, and many left uh, pro professors and and uh, feminist uh, scholars uh, agreed with me on that. That identity politics leads to social division, polarization, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, uh, open thinking, democratic thinking is uh, a totally different thing because mm -hmm. we are all. A part of us is uh, like, yeah, people are different, so we have to accept it. And in a in a democratic society, we have to get used to it and live yes. with it. We live with the differences, accept the differences. Yes. So, yeah, Gordon Hahn, I I thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and long interview. And uh, yes. Despite we have uh, different ideologies and the political views, we agreed on many things. And uh, yeah, it was a nice talk. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. It was great to talk to you and uh, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care now.